racist mind vampires play chess with human bodies and a centuries-old plague turns country folk into pus-oozing, boil-covered sex fiends. And TV sitcom characters come to life to battle a megalomaniacal postal clerk. This is 1989, the year in horror. If the crack don't get you, then the hookers will live. Hello and welcome to part 10 of my 10 part video retrospective of horror from the 1980s where I go year to year, I pick out three titles and read them with fresh eyes and report back to you with my honest opinion. If you're new to the channel, thank you for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed the content. Give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. That keeps me motivated to keep putting out content and I really do appreciate it. My name is Michael, this here is Zvezda. And we will begin our exploration of horror from 1989 by taking a look at some cool cover art uh, from horror books that came out in that year. I've prepared a short montage featuring the music of Alfred Schnitke. Enjoy the montage. I'll see you on the other side for a deep dive into 1989, the year in horror. <laughs> In 1989, Tim Burton's Batman was the number one movie, Look Away by Chicago was the number one song, and Bobby Brown's Don't Be Cruel was the number one album. 1989 was truly a terrifying year, wasn't it? At the cinema, 1989 gave us uh, Pet Cemetery, Psycho Cop, Society, and a slew of sequels. But what about horror at the bookstore? Well, that is the primary uh, focus of this video. And to help answer that question, I read four books that came out in 1989, and I have opinions. Let's start things off by taking a look at Geek Love by Katherine Dunn. Now, I read Geek Love because I kept seeing it come up on lists of like greatest horror books of all time, right? And since it came out in 1989, I thought it would be a great addition to this video retrospective. However, after reading the book, I do not think it's a great addition to this uh, video re retrospective. I think it's a great book, but it is not a horror book, in my opinion. Not even close. Uh, just because something is horrific does not make it horror. Uh, just because someone dies or someone kills someone, that does not make a horror book. Horror has more specific uh, sensibilities and specific uh, structure, tone, and flow. Now, there is a lot of variety in horror, but I just don't think Geek Love is a horror book. So I will make uh, another video where I talk about Geek Love because I think it's excellent and I think it's worth talking about. I found it uh, inventive and interesting. Uh, but just not appropriate for this for this video retrospective. So after Geek Love, I read The Festering by Guy N. Smith, or Guy N. Smith. You will correct my uh, pronunciation in the comment section below. I think it's Guy N. Smith, or uh, Guy N. Smith. Guy in French, Guy in English, maybe. Anyway, uh, I read The Festering, and I chose this book because... Uh, Guy N. Smith uh, was quite a prolific British horror writer. It's prolific, especially in the 1980s. In, in the 1980s, he put out 38 horror novels, including three in his uh, Killer Crabs series. And uh, this was my first um, experience. Ow. 
with uh, with Guy and Smith's work. But judging from his output and from the and from the cover art, I was expecting some uh, schlocky '80s fun, right? So the festering begins with a prologue that is set a uh, hundred a few hundred years ago in uh, in an English village where this um, peasant girl uh, is pines for the village hunk, right? So this village hunk, he goes off to uh, London to consort with harlots in the London brothels. And he returns to the village um, infected with a uh, hideous disease that eats away at his flesh and turns him into some semi-animated sore that's leaking fluids of various colors. So the people in the village, they dig a deep, 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 deep grave and they bury him in this grave. And that's it. That's the prologue. So I really enjoy, um, I really enjoy horror that is, that is based on, um, based on folklore where, uh, contemporary society is built upon, in this sense, literally built upon some ancient folklore or some cursed land. And that's what we have here in the festering because um, we cut to present day or, you know, in the 1980s uh, in a village in England. And this couple, um, husband, wife, they um, decide that they want to leave the big city life and they want to move to the countryside. So they buy a house in the countryside. So we have the clash between um, city life and country life. We have a fish out of water with this couple, you know, trying to fit in. And we have uh, this ancient folklore that resurfaces. So very promising start for me. And what happens is that this couple, they immediately discover that their house, the house that they just bought in the country, uh, it does not have running water. So they hire a local company to dig them a well. And it is in digging this well that they unleash this century's old plague. Now, almost the entire book is set on this couple's property. And there are not that many characters. There's the husband, the wife, the, the head of the company that digs the well, a few of his workers, a plumber, and a doctor. And that's it. And now, I really, really like um, books that are contained within a single location and that contain few uh, characters. That generally leads to a well-focused narrative that really works on me. So, um, so this got, the festering got off to a great start for me. And I was expecting, um, once the plague was released, I was expecting some fun body horror with creative and inventive descriptions of the gore. On this point, um, yeah, I was quite disappointed, uh, on this front. I found, um, the descriptions were not really that inventive or creative and it was kind of re redundant, really not that exciting. Ultimately, um, the festering didn't didn't really do much for me, despite its promising start and its intriguing premise. Uh, it didn't. The book didn't have a villain either, which was a, a missed opportunity. I thought this. The head of the uh, well digging company. He's initially presented as a possible villain candidate. He is a man who is uh, presented as being driven by greed, and he takes advantage of these people in a desperate situation but then later it pivots and, and and we find out that this the head of the company he he really worked hard to build up his company and he provides a service that people need and he backs his work with guarantees so really not that villainous unfortunately ultimately festering um left me a bit underwhelmed it didn't really do much for me i mean it the story works it's just not that exciting and given that this was my first Guy N. Smith uh, experience, um, it did not leave me wanting to check out any more of his work. So I gave it uh, three stars. I didn't hate it, but it didn't really do much for me beyond that. Mm. From 1989, I also read Carrion Comfort by Dan Simmons. Uh, this is a 900 page action horror hybrid. And I, uh, I read this book a few years ago, actually. I didn't read it specifically for this video retrospective. 
I read it because I kept seeing it come up on lists of great, greatest horror books of all time, and I am a sucker for lists. I cannot resist the list. And also, at the time, I had uh, several friends who were recommending I check out The Terror by Dan Simmons. Um, so, for some reason, I didn't check out The Terror. I, I decided, well, I need to read Dan Simmons, but I'll read Carrie and Comfort instead. I think I went into this book with the wrong expectations. Um, since the, the friends who were recommending um, The Terror, these friends were literary snobs, book snobs. Which I know longtime viewers of this channel are going to be shocked to hear that I would associate with book snobs. But it's true. Some of my friends at the time were, were pretty book snobby. So I was expecting with Carrie and Comfort, um, I was expecting something with uh, literary qualities, like a literary horror hybrid. And that is not what Carrie and Comfort is. Carrie and Comfort is... Um, it's a horror action hybrid. It's an air, airport book. An airport book being defined as something that is superficially engaging without being profound. It's meant more to entertain rather than to challenge. It's generally a long but fast-paced um, genre book. And that's, that's what Carry and Comfort is. So I went into it with the wrong expectations and I failed to adjust my expectations while I was reading. So uh, I came away from the experience of not really all that excited about it. But looking back, I can appreciate why, why people might like this book. And um, I think if you go into it with the right expectations, it could, it could really work for you. Because it is well written for what it is for an airport book, right? But I was also frustrated because it reads more like a screenplay, like a well-written, detailed screenplay. Um, there are a lot of action set pieces, and as I'm reading them, I know that none of this is going to have any bearing on the plot. But it would look great on the screen with the special effects. So there's a lot of that in this 900-page book, which I found quite frustrating. We have these mind vampires the a, a group of people a secret society of people who have the power to uh, control people's minds and then they take over their body and use them like they're puppets now there is some infighting going on in this in this secret society because one of the guys he wants to use his power to destroy the world while the other members of the society, they want to use the power just to lead uh, comfortable lives, right? So there's a little bit of infighting going on. And at the beginning of the book, um, one of these uh, man, uh, mind vampires kills a photographer. And the daughter of the photographer, along with a police chief, they, um, they team up to, to find this man, the, the killer. And while they're hunting for... The, their killer, they discover this secret society full of these powerful people, so they go after them too. If you're in the mood for an action horror hybrid airport book, I think Carrie and Comfort could, uh, could satisfy. It's well written, and um, it delivers what it sets out to deliver, I think. There is quite a bit of ugliness in this book. Uh, these mind vampires, they are horrible people, um, racist. And uh, there, are, there are quite a few disturbing scenes. But it would probably make for a good uh, miniseries. I'm surprised, despite the book's success, I'm surprised it was never turned into something theatrical. Although it's probably a bit too long for a single movie, so maybe like a miniseries would work. Now, despite the fact that I didn't really love this book, I still do plan on reading The Terror. And many, many... Um, Viewers of this channel have recommended Hyperion, also by Dan Simmons. So, I'll check out The Terror eventually, soon. And if I like that, then, yeah, I'll move on to Hyperion. You know, I'll take it a book at a time, as it were. And lastly, I will close this uh, 1980s video retrospective with a work from Clive Barker. Which is fitting because Clive Barker is the best thing to happen to horror in the 1980s. And in 1989, he came out with The Great and Secret Show, which is a fantasy horror hybrid. It's book one in the two-part series, Book of the Art. 
but it works perfectly well as a standalone. And uh, book two, Everville, is excellent as well. The Great and Secret Show is a book about Hollywood, sex, and Armageddon, but not necessarily in that order. And like a lot of uh, Clive Barker books, The Great and Secret Show has a spectacular opening scene, which involves a postal clerk in Omaha, Nebraska, who has to sort through undelivered mail. Now, that might not sound enthralling, but it definitely, definitely is. And I'm not even a big fan of uh, physical mail, but still, I found it riveting. That's how good Clive Barker is. In sorting through this undelivered mail, the clerk thinks he's uncovered a secret society that sends him off on an epic quest in search of the dream sea called Quiddity. He then creates a drug, is double-crossed by his co-worker who wants to protect the Dream Sea, so they fight and end up in a crack in the earth in California where their spirits impregnate local teenagers, one of whom gives birth to twins, Joe Beth and Tommy Ray. Which, if each twin has two names, that's four names from just one pregnancy. That's how epic Clyde Barker is, right? Now, I could go on with the plot, but I feel like I might have already said too much while well, not saying anything that's particularly coherent. It's a wild, epic fantasy horror written by the master of the genre. Definitely a great book for fans of that sort of thing. Like me. Having made 10 of these uh, video retrospectives of horror from the 1980s, I have a few t takeaways. Uh, first takeaway takeaway is wow, what a huge drop off from the 1970s, which was the best decade for horror in the, in the 1980s. Wow, uh, things plummeted and plummeted quickly. Uh, second big take takeaway is thank goodness Clive Barker came along to breathe some life into uh, into horror at that time, which was going through a, a rough patch. Also, when I think of horror at the cinema from the 1980s. It's generally quite fun. There's, I mean, there are there's there were a lot of slashers like as well, but there's a lot of fun in the horror that w that came out in the 1980s, and I don't feel like that's really represented represented in the in the books that were published at that time, which is surprising. And also, I feel like the 1980s also probably killed horror for a while because in 1988, as a Thomas Harris came out with. Uh, the Silence of the Lambs, uh, which was a huge hit. And so from from that point on, at least in publishing, uh, the craze was for serial killers. And um, ho even with some horror aspects, but really focused on p police procedurals and serial killers. And that was all the craze for easily the next 10 years after that. So horror took a big hit following that and following its probably the excess and the mediocre, mediocrity of the 1980s. Um, but it did recover. I think horror is strong now, but, it, but it, took, it took a hit. Do you have any experience with any of the uh, books or the authors I talked about in this video? What is your favorite works of horror from this era? Have you watched all 10 videos in this series? Uh, if so, which one is your favorite? And can you identify where exactly I went off the rails? Was I ever really on the rails? Should I continue this video retrospective into the 1990s? I won't, but should I? Have you purchased your copy of Edifice Complex yet? If so, I look forward to reading your honest review of this strange work where an Algerian immigrates to Paris and has his tenuous hold on reality further jeopardized when he develops an erotic obsessive relationship with a residential building set for demolition. Edifice Complex, redefining what is meant by homesick. And if you have not purchased your copy of Edifice Complex yet, what are you doing with your life? I look forward to connecting with you in the comment section. Thank you for watching. I'll see you at the next video. Thank <laughs> you.